Hi, I'm Charmaine Nero with the IASF's communications team, and welcome to today's webinar on the Energy Hazard Guide. Today, we're welcomed by an array of guests on our panel, and I'll introduce first Sean DeCrane, Assistant to the General President for Health and Safety. Next to Sean, we have Chris Towski with Local 30 joining us at the round table, thank you. And right here, we have Chris Green, a retired member of Local 27. Thank you all for joining us here today, and Sean, let's get started with you. Can you tell us a little bit about why the Energy Hazard Guide was created? Yeah, thank you, Charmaine. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, health and safety is one of the highest priorities for the IFF, for our members. And throughout my 26 years in the Cleveland Fire Department, I recognized I didn't have a lot of training when it came to responding to energy incidents, yet we respond to them all the time. And we have members who are injured career-changing, life-changing injuries and fatalities in responding to energized incidents. So I was having a conversation one day with uh, Chris Green here from Seattle, and I was curious on the program that Chris was helping to lead and develop for the Seattle Fire Department on an energy response guide. And I thought, the IFF has 355,000 members and we have a really deep bench. And really, I wanted to bring that talent to the table to educate our members on maybe bringing them up to speed on how to respond to energized incidents. And that really led to this project from Chris's work in Seattle. And can you share a little bit about that work in Seattle and what inspired you to be a part of this, Chris? Well, July of 2014 really was, was, the, was the change. Uh, there was an incident at a substation that didn't go so well. Uh, after that, uh, I was asked to meet with Seattle City Light. That's the utility provider for the city of Seattle. And with the expectation to close some of these gaps to maybe help develop out a more predictable uh, response for not just the fire service, but also for utilities to build in predictability. Um, and from that came the energy response team that operates out of Fire Station 25 in Seattle, Washington. And it's the blueprint for what we've created here. And I'll ask you the same question. What inspired you to be a part of this? So, so thank you for the question, Charmaine. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my motivation into this is not only do I have 30 years with the Cambridge Fire Department, but I have 40 years in the electrical industry. And coming with the electrical, the licensed electrician background, what I've seen when I got promoted back in 2005 was that we definitely had some gaps. From the time that we were hired as new recruits to where we currently sit, we still don't seem to be connected with where the world has gone and where the world has changed. Significant incident-wise, we had something that took place in December of 2006. It was a substation, it was a transformer vault fire in the basement of a high-rise building. And when I looked at that and I connected all those dots of the previous stuff that I was doing and being newly into the fire prevention scene and getting into the codes and standards, was connecting all these things and seeing that we definitely had some issues here. So it just tried to you know, launch myself into getting into something that could make things better. Hence came with the, the role of the electrical safety officer role for the Cambridge Fire Department, and I was able to do some minor programs. Didn't have the outreach that my colleague here, Chris Green, had with Seattle, but fortunately through the stuff that um, Sean has been able to do with us through the international side of it has really gotten us to where we are today. I'm just a little sad that it's to the tail end of my career, you know, being 30 years into it. I would have liked things to be faster progression, but we are where we are, and it's a, it's a beautiful day going forward. Don't worry, this is going to be an ongoing effort, so you get a whole new career out of you. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean, we'll, we'll circle back to you. What are some of the knowledge gaps that prompted this guide in the first place? Really, if you start to look at the topics that are in the guide, when we started the conversation, we started talking about overhead wires and switch gear and vaults, and then we started going down every rabbit hole. And from the IFF perspective, we have just completed a research project under the Department of Energy responding to energy storage systems in a residence. And as we discussed more and more, we just saw all these gaps in, in energy and responding to energized incidents, the hazards that were present and some of the considerations to it. That really led to just this idea taking off. And so when I start thinking about the gaps, I'll turn to my colleagues here, but you know, responding to that switch gear responding to that underground vault. Those were big gaps for me. Yeah, and I'll, I'll join you and Chris as well. What are some of the gaps that you noticed? 
gap-wise is really how much as us as firefighters want to think we know about stuff that we really don't. And that was even unveiling for me because having the electrical background and being part of the project in the forefront, I was in a little different perspective. But as I got deeper and deeper into it, and as we started just questioning ourselves and kicking the can around, realizing that we don't know as much as we think we really do know. So um, hopefully this will be a nice bridging of all that. Absolutely. And I know you talked about the personal story that affected why you wanted to be involved, but what gaps have you noticed in Seattle in the area you are in? Uh, they're, they're really the same gaps that are there really throughout the international fire service community. It's, you know, there's, there's energy is present at, at every emergency, every event that we go to. Mm -hmm. We really don't understand it. Our training is limited to what the energy utility can provide with their time allowed. It's also through the lens of the way they experience energy. The way the fire experiences, experiences energy is very different. It's under an emergency. There's duress. There are real problems. You can't expect that the energy platform, whatever it is, whether it be an EV battery or a switch gear or a substation, oftentimes when we show up, it's because the platform is unstable. It is dangerous. And yet there is still an expectation to perform and do rescues and suppress fires and all of that. So triaging that in a way that works for the fire service really needed to come from the fire service. So we buttressed what we, the information we got from utility providers with really experienced firefighters from all across the country um, with how, what has their experience been with energy? And then we, we built something that would help us move forward properly for our crews. And thank you so much. And I'll open it up to the panel with this question, but we know the dangers. What are the goals of this energy hazard guide? Well, I've gone first each time. I was gonna let them go first, but <laughs> yeah, uh, some good. of the goals, uh, you know, really is to educate our members. Uh, an educated firefighter is an empowered firefighter. And as Chris and Chris have mentioned, we have to make decisions on the fire ground or emergency ground in split seconds. So. The goal is to educate the firefighters so they can make informed decisions on the fire ground to keep themselves safe, their crews safe, and the citizens safe. And to piggyback off that, a goal would be to, especially in today's times, certainly through my lens, what I'm experiencing with some misinformation that's going out there and with some things that are trying to like, like, we'll probably talk about it here again, but things that are hitting to the marketplace that are trying to drive the fire service into saying this is the best we call snake oil when we talk, but this is the best product that you should use and the only product you, and this is hopefully the goal would be to put this in check. Give this, again, like Chris had mentioned, from firefighters to firefighters, the reality behind that, yeah, there might be some stuff out there and it may work, but the reality is these are the best pathways you should go in and give them that and then something that's clear and right in front of them. So. Absolutely. And as far as what information is in this energy hazard guide, can you explain what we're seeing? And I'll, I'll start with you, Chris. Yeah, so the information in the, in the guide is really broken down into a couple of different sections. And uh, there's an emergency section, which identifies the eight most common incidents where energy is the driving factor. So a substation event would be one of those categories. Uh, a vault fire, manhole fire, a switch gear, uh, wires down, where energy is really driving the hazard. That's your primary hazard. There's a, there's a section that covers all of that, offers, offers identification uh, um, uh, tactics, it offers strategies, it offers resources. So for an ongoing emergency, there's a section for that. There's also just kind of a developed content section where if you just wanna elevate the energy acumen of your crew in the service, this is where you go. This would be for information like how does your PPE perform under shock conditions? That's all in there. Um, how does energy work? That's all in there. Like there's lesson plans that can be developed in there. Um, people who have been injured, case studies of people who have been injured by residential energy and their careers have been ended. Those stories are in there from those members. And there's, there's lessons to be learned that were captured and they're inside the guide. So the guide is, is really intended to elevate that energy acumen for the fire service. And it does it be, through recognizing that we're not always on an emergency scene. We also need to get better at just understanding energy. And what I akin that to is when we all came in the fire service, we spend years doing building construction. So whether you're a builder or not, you do building construction because when that structure is on fire, you're, you're much better prepared to deal with it and forecast where your problem areas will be. 
Energy is the same thing. And we structured this guide in such a format that it would be user friendly for the reader, and it could be used both in a downtime as like a, as a training piece to it, whatever folks want to call in these regions, you know, training protocols or training exercises, or it could be used. Hey, if something just happened. What can I use to help get me over to something that I might have questioned? And now, oh, okay, I have something that makes a little bit more sense. So all to help them with those on scene. Um, decisions that need to be made and some stuff in the downtime so they can learn and explore and really get themselves in tune to the whole energy piece to it so they understand it a lot better because it's a lot it's around us as firefighters a lot more than that we want to let our minds believe it to be and i think one you guys pretty covered it pretty well i think one of the important sections that we have in each section of the guide are indicators that energy is involved when we look at some of these incidents, whether it's Texas and just a simple resident, in our minds, a simple residential fire in a controlled state and a member has not just a career ending injury, but a life changing injury from that. When we have a member killed out in California, there were indicators during that scene that may have led them to understand what was actually happening, but they they didn't know what they were looking for. They didn't recognize the indicators that they saw. So as this goes section by section, we're getting some of those indicators. And then once you have those indicators, then we're setting up the strategic considerations, the tactical considerations. And I know we're gonna talk about additional supplemental content, but that is, I think, the real value of this guide. And the fact that you can you can train at the firehouse. You can take a section each shift and go through it. But it's also down, also downloadable and searchable when you're responding or on the incident. And thank you, Sean. And getting into our next question, you know, we, we have the information, we have the goal. How can firefighters obtain this guide? It's easy and it's free. Uh, you go to the IFF website, so www.iff.org. It's on our learning management system. Uh, you can go through it on, on the website, you can go through it on your tablet, you can go through it on your phone, but it's easily accessible through the IFF website. We talked about tactical information and strategy. Is there any other supplemental information that we should know about this guide? And Chris, I'll, I'll go right to you. Yeah, um, with this guide, there's the recognition that there's an inherent risk when there's energy as part of your fire scene. Um, and members get injured, they get hurt. And one of the frustrations that we've heard from, from people who have been negatively affected by these, these incidents, by energy, is uh, what's the path to recovery? Uh, how, do, how, do, how do the on-scene resources triage and, sh and ensure that our members are getting the proper treatment? And again, really that path to recovery, it's not clear, it's murky. People that we've spoken to that have been injured by energy, um, they're all very frustrated with how do I, you know, how do I recognize symptoms that are bad? How do, who, who do I go to? It's a specialized field. And the guide really does help to, to, um, to offer those resources through the, uh, the Byrne Foundation, through the IFF, um, that's, and that's identified inside the guide also. One of the challenges I think is that initial, initially on the scene, people don't recognize this is a burn injury. They look at it as a trauma injury and they start treating it as a trauma injury. But consistently during some of these incidents, we've seen that the members more affected by the burn injury, especially an internal burn injury. And the IFF has 16 uh, burn coordinators. They're assigned or pointed to each district. And really their role is to be the advocate for our members for proper burn care and creating educational materials. And we have that on the IFF website as well. So. We have that information incorporated into the guide, working with our burn coordinator, Phil, tomorrow to make sure that we can offer that information to our membership. Absolutely. And I want to make sure we're drilling in how important it is to have this guide. Can I ask all of you just to comment on anything else you want to add or anything that our members should know? I'll start with you, Chris. I would say uh, I'm incredibly grateful that the IFF has taken on this challenge. Um, I'm very grateful that Seattle City Light and Seattle Fire endeavored years ago to, to take on a, this similar challenge. Um, the, the, the fact that we've gone this long without having a, an energy hazard training resource built by the fire service for the fire service 
Um, that gap is being closed now. This is one of a kind. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm so proud that the IFF is launching this inaugural guide because I, I think this is something that, that is going to be for today's firefighter, for posterity. I think it's something that could be used on every incident. It's that important for the firefighters to understand this stuff. And the fact that the IAFF has championed this thing, um, that's exactly where it should come from. And thank you, and Chris, I'll bring you in. I'm, I'm Mimic. A little different pathway though is I'm looking forward to actually hearing the unmeasurable, hearing the piece that, hey, this actually did an impact. This actually saved me. This actually prevented me from getting hurt. I'm looking forward to hearing that type of feedback that comes in from it. And then we know that we hit the mark or we need to make some adjustments and what that looks like. And Sean, any last words? Yeah, I mean, this document's gonna be a live document. We've talked about that. We have a changing environment. It seems we have a more energized environment and our society continues to move that way. So. Most incidents, most incidents we respond to, that our members respond to, will involve energy in one form or another, whether it's battery, whether it's from the grid, whether it's self-generated, uh, on-site, it'll be there. And I think this guide is incredibly important. It gives us a pathway to educate our members. And it's just not for IFF members. It's for the fire service community as a whole. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank a few people, especially General President Edward Kelly. He empowered us to create this. Uh, AFG, with, this was created with an AFG program. Uh, you know, a shout out again how important these AFG programs are for the fire service and what the IFF has been able to create. I want to thank Chris Green and Chris Towski as our subject matter experts. Julie Zipper is our content developer. Uh, Julie may have lost a lot of hair dealing with us over the last few months, but I really stayed with it and put this together. And I'll just, you know, want to finalize and say, really to our members, this document is for you. It's for you to learn from, it's for you to use, and we want you to go and download it. We believe it's going to be critically important for you moving forward so that you stay safe. Well, thank you for all of our panelists joining us today and for everybody watching our webinar. See you next time.